And Republican Representative Joe Nylans and his Democratic challenger Deb Colsty join me now. And the two of you have uh, sparred a bit over the state budget, education funding in particular, all things uh, money in the campaign so far. So I want to ask both of you, starting with Mr. Nylans, uh, name one, just one thing uh, truly irresponsible that, that could be described of as a irresponsible use of state dollars, because that's something that a lot of people really focus on is, is where is the government waste? Is there something you well, can pinpoint? I, I think there's a lot of abuses in, in badger care. As I knock on doors and talk to people, a lot of the constituents in Janesville are concerned about the abuse of badger care, where people could uh, take a full-time job and still keep badger care instead of taking the employment-based insurance, because it's cheaper and it's better insurance, but the taxpayers are subsidizing that. And some of the some of the recommendations I had two years ago when I came up there with, with Dennis Smith, the Secretary of Health and Human Services, was to um, suggest that we use badger care for backup or secondary for people who have uh, full-time employment where they can take the employment-based insurance. That will free up badger care because as you knock to people, you knock on their doors and you talk to them, a lot of them are telling me, hey, I've been laid off for three to six months and I tried to get on badger care, but this full, I could not get on badger care. We need to open Badger Care up for those people. So uh, I guess fraud and abuse is one thing that's irresponsible at the state level we need to clean up. Ms. Colsey? Well, I think the $2.36 billion over 10 years um, tax breaks or giveaways to the corporations are what caused the budget to um, come impact the middle class just in a horrible manner. You know, they said it was going to be about um, austerity but the budget was actually $1.1 .1 billion larger than the, the biennium before. And they talked about shared sacrifice, but the only people that shared the sacrifice were the low income and the middle income and the corporations and the high income earners, you know, reap the rewards. But I think it's important that we deal with those um, tax give, giveaways because they didn't create jobs. It, it, it was of no benefit to the state to give away those dollars. And I'm sure there are some um, corporate tax credits that are um, useful, especially on the local level, but um, there's no sense of fairness. There's no sense of proportion for the middle class. And, and if we don't have some mechanism to make sure that they're going to create jobs, I, I, I don't think they're useful. Well, as you know, uh, the 44th includes Janesville. Yes. And we know what the impact on it has been of jobs uh, since GM closed and the, and the uh, the effects uh, of that as well beyond the doors of, J of uh, GM Janesville. What is government's role, and we'll start with Ms. Colsey, what is the government's role in, in bringing in new jobs, creating jobs, and what's your, what's your viewpoint on that? Well, I think, you know, in some degrees, I think it's not the responsibility of government, but I think that in this manner, they have they've taken the responsibility of giving tax breaks, et cetera, to corporations. If we were going to give tax breaks, I would give them to the middle class so that they can then have just the middle class and the lower income will spend the money in the act of living. I think it's cycling money through the economy that creates prosperity. And I think that if the middle class has, the, has money in their pockets, they will spend it. That will entice small businesses to maybe create some more jobs. And small businesses are, you know, the majority of corporate or businesses in Wisconsin, and they, and they actually employ more people in large corporations. So mm -hmm. I, th I think it's getting money back in the hands of the middle class. Representative Nellens, how well, can the government play a role I think in helping that's where jobs? Deb and I differ on the corporate tax breaks because a lot of the tax breaks that we passed went to the small business people, the small businesses that were starting up or trying to expand. These tax credits went, and if they created a job, they got a tax break. So if there's no job created, there's no tax break handed out to them. I mean, it, that's a, a difference. I mean, Deb keeps mentioning corporate, corporate, corporate. A lot of those tax breaks didn't go to the big corporations. Again, they went to the small business. And that's what we need to do. And what's the government's role? A government's role is to get out of the way, still regulate, but get out of the way and let these businesses open up and flourish and not drag them down with higher taxes and drag them down with higher regulations. A lot of folks in the Janesville area in particular who have been affected by what's happened at, at GM have sought to retrain by going through our technical colleges. We've talked a lot in some of these debates about how technical colleges, at least from a state funding perspective, was cut in the last legislative session. How do you answer some of those claims? Why did that happen? And, and what are the, uh, how do you view that? I mean, it, how can we uh, expect our technical colleges to retrain people when their, their funding is going down? 
Well, their funding has gone down because we didn't have the money at the state level. We, we cut money out of education. We put that into Medicaid programs, $1.2 billion. We put into Medicaid programs like Badger Care and other programs for the people who truly need it. Yes, people need educations, but if we have pr pr people with health problems and health issues, they need the care too because that's life or death. That's not just education. Now, to the, to the technical college, we also gave them the ability to adjust their budgets through the collective bargaining of Act 10, and we saw some of the technical colleges took advantage of that, and they have been adding some classes in. But the enrollment is still up to the maximum, and at Blackhawk Tech in my hometown, the maximum is up to the ma the enrollment is at the max right now, and they're retraining people. We get people that I went worked with at General Motors that are nurses, going to school to be nurses, going to school to be CPAs. They're going to school to change their their whole career after they're 35, 40 years old. So you know, I think that the technical colleges are um, experiencing great growth, and they're also experiencing. Um, a, a good, doing a good job. We heard Representative Nylans talk about how, how you know, their, hand, their hands are tied a bit with money. Uh, how would you have done that differently, and if so, how? Well, back to Mr. Nylon's comments about the tax breaks um, being written in the budget only if they created jobs, but it's written in the budget. That's dollars that are taken up that are not available to other programs like education. When you cut $71 million, which is about a half of the um, technical college budget in the, in, in the state budget, it's going to have impact. Then you take on top of that that students now also have, they've cut the um, funding for grants to, for students to attend college. Now you've got a dilemma. So we read in the paper that there is a skills gap. Well, that could be written. You've, you've diminished the funding of um, K-12 by 1.6 billion. You've diminished the funding of the university system by 315 million and the, then the technical colleges, so, and you add on top of that, no child left behind, there's just going to be less students being able to get into the technical fields. You know, again, it's just priorities. He said we didn't have money in the budget to help the this collegiate or the um, technical college system, but they did. Instead, they, they gave, put it in the form of tax, um, tax breaks. Next question, Act 10. It's been a big uh, issue, obviously. We've covered it, uh, you know, beyond uh, normal uh, news coverage story, but it's a huge story. It impacts a lot of people. We'll start with you on this question, uh, Ms. Colsty. Is this a, a closed book on Act 10, or can we expect to see this dealt with on a legislative level, even beyond what the court systems are looking at right now? Well, I think it shows that it's flawed and that the court systems are taking a look at it. But I think it's something that will come back. I, I don't think that there's ever harm in sitting down and negotiating for the, the greater good that can come of it. Um, that, you know, you just cannot have one-sided management and employee. It, it just will not work. And I, I think it will come back, and I think that it behooves us to take a look at it. Um, you know, you, the employees had come forward with um, concessions in, in um, benefits. But they weren't looked at. I don't think that was the objective of this. I think the objective was to do just what it did and, and to take the power out of the workers' hands. Representative, it's in the courts now, but uh, is it time to move on, in your view? Yes, I think it is time to move on. Um, it, it's going to go through the court system. It's going to go to the Supreme Court, and whatever the decision the Supreme Court comes up with is what we'll live by, whether it's uh, to reverse Act 10 or keep Act 10 on the books. Whatever their their decision is, we'll live by. But to, to get back to the comment that Ms. Colty said about um, the collective bargaining and that it, it's not, there shouldn't be just a uh, management and employee-based decision, but that's what's like in the private sector. I worked in that private sector at General Motors. We had the employee union and we had management. We didn't have people from the union on the management side. And that's the difference between public sector unions and private sector unions. Unions go out and endorse, ask me as endorse my, my, can, my opponent here. So that means that ask me as asked my opponent to do things for her to get that endorsement. That's how it works. She's carrying the water for ask me in Madison. I carry the water for the taxpayers not any union, because the taxpayers elect to be, not unions, and that's where it should be. Finally, uh, taxpayers and voters have seen a lot of uh, bickering between the two sides. What can you two do, to, uh, if elected, whoever wins, what can you do to bring back civility to the chamber so that we can, and I know there are a lot of things that there are, there is bipartisan, uh, a lot of bipartisan measures being passed that we don't give as, as much attention, but 
How can how can people work together? And we'll start with you. If reelected, what can you do to bring civility back sure. to the assembly chamber? Uh, and, and I've worked with the other side. I've worked with the Democrats, and I brought them together on the five pieces of legislation that I proposed as a legislator my freshman year. They got overwhelming Democrat support on all five of them. One of them was a was a bill that's been on the books for 20 years, trying to get passed through. Democrats and Republicans both tried to get it passed through, and it helped the blind and visually impaired. My opponent said, "Well, that's this. It's a bill that should have been passed through, but it took 20 years for somebody to get it passed through." I was able to bring the publishers in. I was able to bring the Democrats and all the advocates in in a in a conference room with 30 publishers on the phone, working out a deal. We passed that deal, but. When I originally po uh, proposed the, the bill, it had 18 co-sponsors, 14 of them were Democrats, because I brought up pieces of legislation that we could agree on and pass through. I've forged relationships with Democrats on the other side of the aisle, and I will continue to do that, and I can work with the relationships I've already forged. Ms. Goldstein, uh, how, how can you do that if elected? Well, again, I say that there are some bills, I mean, some bills are just going to be universally accepted by everybody. They're just, they go back with the act of getting um, housekeeping done or something we all agree on, Aaron Rodgers and the Packers yeah. and the Whitewater football. But it's, it's about the big items and it's not about, bipartisanship means that you compromise. When you're having big policy changes and big changes in the budget, it's about compromise. And I don't think there was any compromise. Mr. Nylans voted 99.4% of the time with the Republican leadership. I've been married for over 35 years to a very wonderful man, and I don't agree with him 99.4% of the time. I think it, it's, it's about talking. It's about talk, You know, I, in, in Janesville, I work with a very diverse, I, I, I'm on lots of committees and, and boards, and I work with a very diverse group of people, people that have really different um, points of view. But more importantly, people from every social economic group in the city. And I think that gives a perspective on how you can come reach a consensus that will benefit the greater, the greater good. Well, thank you very much for joining us for this discussion. Thank Best you. Best of luck to both of you on Election Day. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it.